Pastor Tristan and Erica have, we've been great friends for some time. We actually were in the same uh, season of singleness and then the same season of dating and courting and then uh, engagement and marriage all within the same time frame. We were like a, three, a few weeks behind them as far as uh, getting engaged and then getting married. We were in each other's weddings. And uh, it was a fun season. Ryan and Tristan were actually roommates for a little bit before we got married. And so all that to say, lots and lots and lots of stories. Uh, I won't share them all with you. Uh, and I will, I will preface it by saying I had just come out of the military and out of the world when I first uh, started interning at The Rock. And so my filter wasn't quite fully where it <laughs> should have been yet. So lots of uh, funny stories uh, that I could share, but I'll, I'll spare you. But I will say, that uh, Pastor Tristan is quite the jokester and uh, we worked in the office together and he would always like scare people and play pranks on them and all, I mean often and uh, so Pastor Tammy and I one time thought we're gonna get him like we're gonna get him we just had it and so we went in his office and we hid in his office and I hid under his desk and Tammy hid in his kind of like bookshelf next to his bookshelf, on the side of his bookshelf. Well, Pastor Tristan also likes to talk. And so he was out there uh, in the common area by the copy machine talking to people. And so I'm like crouched under his desk waiting for him to come in so I can just kind of like, ah, and then Tammy get him on the other side. Well, we're there, and I'm starting to get uncomfortable. And I hear it, he's talking and talking, and we're like, okay, like be quiet and go to work, right? <laughs> So like 20 minutes pass, and so finally we're like, just forget it. And we just walk out of his office. I don't think he even, I don't even know if you ever knew that we did that. So we were trying so hard to get him, um, but it failed. But I will say he's gotten us many a times, and I have, I have actually gotten you a few times. So do, do you have anything you wanted to share about them? Yeah, I could just share one. Thing. You know, his jokes and his, his practical jokes are legendary in the office at The Rock. I won't share any of those. But one funny thing, my history with Tristan is we used to look more alike, I think, back in the day, maybe. And uh, we kind of look alike now, but if you've ever been to the Rock in Anaheim, it's a, it's a massive campus. It, you know, if you're sitting in the sanctuary, you know, if you're in the back, I mean, it's like, get binoculars, right? <laughs> but uh, so I remember when I was interning there and when I was on staff there, just walking around the campus, and, you know, occasionally people would come up to me and they would say, Pastor Tristan! And at first, I would just correct them. It's like, oh, no, I'm actually Ryan. You know, I'm not Pastor Tristan. And, you know, be gracious about it. What happened often enough where I just stopped saying anything. <laughs> I, so I, I had to always be on my game because people thought I was Pastor Tristan, you know. Or, so it was kind of like training, I would say. And so with that, Pastor Tristan, we can invite you up. One second. I just wanted to say on a, on a, on a spiritual note, they are amazing, anointed, godly couple. I want to be like Erica when I grow up. She is just such a gracious, gracious woman. And Pastor Tristan, you are one of the best teachers of the word that I know. And I remember back in the day when we would get together and all do our devotions together when we were single. Like we'd go to the coffee shop, a handful of us. And he'd share stuff from his journal. And I'm like, I want to I want to get that. Like, how did you get that? Where did that come from? You know, and so, but just over the years, seeing that anointing and that grace on him to teach the word, he's often one of the speakers at Rock Conference, and his message is one of the ones that usually cuts me really good in, in a good way to the heart, and the Lord uses to, to uh, mold me and shape me and make me more like him. So thank you for your guys' ministry, and we're so excited to have you with us this morning for the very first time. Pastor Tristan, would you come up and bring the word? Would you give him a big rock welcome? We love you. I think we looked a lot more alike, Ryan, um, but I got fatter. <laughs> I... Uh, after marriage, I gained uh, 40 pounds. So if you can imagine where I'm at today, I was 40 pounds lighter. And uh, so marriage has been been good. You know what's, what's funny is uh, now that I know that people would mistake you for me, if anybody has any bad stories, I'll say, oh, it was Ryan. That must have been Ryan, <laughs> not me. Um, by the way, you know what's funny is someone was talking to Erica. Was that at Rock Conference last year or was talking to Erica, my wife? 
and a congregation member uh, from The Rock was talking to her and spent, what, a good 20 minutes and was like, so how are you doing? How are things going? So they were talking. Eric was getting real personal. So they're asking questions like, so how's marriage going? Oh, it's going really good, this and that and the other. And they were going on like for 20 minutes. And then the lady goes, well, it's nice seeing you, Francesca. See you later. <laughs> and so I was like, so uh, this person thought they were talking to Francesca <laughs> the whole time. So I guess it goes um, uh, around. Also, I have known Francesca for, I think, 17 years. It's been, it's been a long time I've known Francesca. And I remember one particular time when we were doing some work days, she was on a boom lift. I don't know if you know what a boom lift is. It's, I mean, like what they used to work on telephone poles at the top. And so she's up doing something on a palm tree. I think we were putting Christmas lights or something on this really tall palm tree. So she's way up there. Somebody is in the, the boom lift with you. I'm not sure who was in there with you, but I'm down on the bottom. And I look up and I said, hey, that looks a little high and dangerous for a girl. And she said, well, it's a good thing you're not up here. <laughs> and I thought, all right. So that was the beginning of sarcasm and everything there. So anyway, we have a, a good time. And then, of course, Ryan and I were roommates, and that was before we got married. Not we got married, before we married our wives, <laughs> just to be clear. you got to clarify that. But uh, anyway, it is good to be here with you guys for the first time. And my wife and I actually started the Seal Beach Campus of The Rock back in 2011, which was the second of the satellite campuses, second to Kalamazoo, and then we started Seal Beach. So my wife and I uh, launched that congregation. We were there for five and a half years before coming back to the Anaheim campus where now I'm serving there as one of the pastors. And so I know what it's like to not only be a lead pastor, but also to be a part of a congregation of the rock. And it really is a very uh, amazing uh, ministry, and it really is an amazing uh, opportunity that we had to go out there and get to know a community, and so it's always good to be on the satellite campuses. I like being on the satellite campuses of the Rock. So uh, I don't know if you brought your Bible with you today, but we're going to get into God's Word. Now, do you guys lift up your Bibles and say this? This is a tradition we have here at the Rock, and so if you didn't bring your Bible, that's all right. Bring it next week, even though I won't be here, but bring it next week, and let's say this out loud together. Ready? Go. This is my Bible. It it is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. All right, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7, and we're going to turn to another scripture also in Matthew, so I'm not going to have you turn to both right now because they're really next door to each other. But in Matthew chapter number 7 is where I'd like you to turn. And as you're turning there, you know, I was praying really about what is it that the Lord wants to share this weekend, and I really felt like the Lord wanted to talk about prayer. You know, prayer is one of the most important disciplines in the life of a Christian. And even if you're not a Christian and you ask somebody in the world, uh, what is it that Christians should be doing or what should Christians do? You'll typically get probably the top three. They should go to church, read the Bible, and pray and maybe give to the poor, right? So if you were to add a fourth, most people, even in the world, understand what Christians ought to be doing. Go to church read the Bible, pray, you know, and maybe give to the poor. But what's interesting is I have found that so many people that are believers and are in church, maybe when they first get saved, they first get born again, they're much more excited about those disciplines, about going to church, about being in the Word, reading the Bible, prayer. But sometimes over time, we get a little casual with those disciplines. I've also seen that even though there's a majority in the body of Christ do attend church regularly and they understand the importance of being in the Word, it seems that prayer sometimes is on the back burner. Like if I get around to it, or that's just for really spiritual people, or only if you're really feeling like you're in a significant time of need, am I going to stop and pray? But I want to show you today from God's Word that prayer is so much more powerful than what I believe so many of us have relegated it to. It is very powerful, and we're going to see some of that uh, today uh, with our time. And so I want us to uh, begin here by talking about prayer. Now, we're not studying prayer just to get more information about prayer. We're going to study prayer so that we can become a people of prayer. 
right? That's what we want to walk away today, putting the word of God into action. So I want to encourage you to put this word into action. So the Lord is calling us to be a people of prayer. I have three points for this morning's message, and here's point number one, that prayer is a key spiritual instrument that causes God's will to come to pass. Prayer is a key spiritual instrument that causes God's will to come to pass. Now, that's really important to understand. That's important to understand because there's a lot of people who mistakenly believe that if it is God's will, then it will automatically come to pass. If God wants me to have this, then I'll have it. If God doesn't want me to have this, then I won't have it. It's God's will, and God's will will automatically come to pass. And let me tell you, that is not true. You might not have ever heard that before. That might be somewhat news to you because so many people just think, well, if it's God's will, it'll just happen. But you will not find that language anywhere in the Bible. In fact, you're going to find quite the opposite. God's will is not automatic. God's will is something that we need to embrace, we need to believe, and we need to proactively go after the will of God in our lives. It doesn't just happen because it's God's will, and it doesn't just happen because it's our will. It happens when we engage with God's plan and engage with his will, and prayer is a key spiritual instrument that causes God's will to come to pass. So you will find that people of prayer tend to see more of God's promises and more of God's will coming to pass in their life because prayer is one of those instruments that brings God's will into the natural. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But this is in the Bible, of course, and you see examples of it as well. For example, the children of Israel. It was God's will for the first generation of the children of Israel to get into the promised land. Isn't that right? But they didn't get in. Even though it was God's will, he spoke to them and said, I've given it to you. And he did. But they didn't receive it. And it's not because God didn't give it to them. It's because they did not embrace his plan and embrace his will. And they didn't walk it out. So they didn't see it come to pass. In the New Testament, the Bible says this. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Now, that's pretty clear. God is not willing that any should perish. It is not God's will for anybody to die and go to hell. That's not his will. But are there people who are going to die and go to hell against the will of God? Yes. Why? Because the Bible says we are saved when we confess with our mouth. You know, that's a form of prayer. The Lord Jesus, we confess, we pray, we, we come before the Lord and we submit to his plan. That's when we get saved. But there's a lot of people who will not submit to God's plan, and so it won't automatically happen. See, the Lord gives us choice. He lets us choose. The Old Testament says, I've set before you blessing and cursing. And he says, choose blessing. And death and life, choose life. See, we have a choice whether or not we want to take the plan of God or we want to take another plan. So prayer is a key spiritual instrument that causes God's will to come to pass. Now, there was a time when the disciples asked Jesus a question, and we're talking about prayer. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And the reason why they were asking Jesus to teach them to pray is because they saw that Jesus was a man of prayer. In fact, we're going to look at some scriptures in just a moment of the prayer life of Jesus. They saw it, and they saw that God the Father answered his prayers, and he walked in supernatural blessing of the Lord. Now, I'm not talking materialism and greed. I'm talking about when people tried to kill him, they couldn't. When people tried to trap him in their words, they couldn't. When um, they needed to pay taxes, and Jesus says, Peter, go drop your line in there, and there's going to be a coin in there. How did he know that? He was a man who was so connected with his father, communicated with his father. Remember the five loaves and the two fish, and he fed the 5,000 men there besides women and children. So there could have been upwards of 10, some scholars believe even maybe 20 to 25,000 people there because the Bible only records 5,000 men, and it says besides women and children. So there's definitely a lot more than 5,000, but the Bible says that he gave thanks. He lifted up his eyes to the Lord, blessed it, and gave thanks. He's praying, and he saw uh, 
breakthrough and he saw miracles happen and the disciples see this in Jesus' life and they had to have made a connection between the fact that supernatural things were happening in the life of Jesus and they saw that he was a man of prayer, so they were connecting the dots. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to teach me how to pray prayers that get answered, don't you? And so that's what I want to help us with today. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, in Luke eleven two, 2, this is his response. And this is the beginning of the Lord's prayer. But I'm only going to highlight one part of it. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and notice this, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus is telling us, pray that God's will be done on earth. Now again, if God's will is automatic, there would be no reason for Jesus to tell us that his will come to pass. Isn't that right? There'd be no reason to pray it. Oh, if it's God's will, it'll just happen. No, he's saying it is God's will, but pray, Lord, your will be done on earth and in my life and in my church and in my marriage and in my family and in my health and in my finances. Amen. Your will. See, when you know what God's will is, and you'll find it in the Bible, what God's will says is will is healing and provision and uh, restoration. You know what I'm saying? There's promises all over this book, and when you see a promise in the Bible, it won't just happen automatically. You've got to engage with it and say, Lord, I, through prayer, engage with that promise and pray and declare that's going to come to pass in my life. I call and claim that promise into my family. Amen? So Jesus is telling us we need to pray that his will be done. So prayer is a key spiritual instrument. It's not the only one. But it's a key spiritual instrument that causes God's will to come to pass. So let's be a people of prayer. Amen. And listen, when you become a person of prayer, this is powerful, you become an instrument that causes God's will to come to pass. Because now you are engaging with something that causes God's will to come to pass. And you become an instrument. So when people come to you and say, can you pray for my marriage? Can you pray for me? You as a person of prayer can be used as an instrument to cause God's will to come to pass even in other people's life. That's called intercession. That's a prayer of intercession. It's powerful. You can be an instrument used by God to cause his will to come to pass. Here's point number two. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. 1 John 5.14 says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, so we need to pray God's will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions, that word petitions means prayer requests, whatever our requests are to God, we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So what this verse is telling us is when we pray according to God's will, we know that he hears us, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the prayer requests, the answers, in other words, to those things that we have asked of him. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that this verse also addresses the issue of God's will not being automatic. Because this verse tells us that it already is God's will. It says, but if we pray according to his will, we will have the petitions that we have asked of him. So what that means is we have to ask for the things that we want from the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't come through supernaturally and cause things to happen in our lives, but this verse is telling us there are things that are in God's will, and he wants you to ask him for those things to come to pass. Amen? And so we need to uh, be a people of prayer. Look at it again. Whatever we ask, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of him, not wanted of him, but asked of him. I don't know about you. I want to be someone who asks the Lord for things because I want the Lord to answer my prayers. Isn't that right? And so Jesus says this in Matthew 7. I ask you to turn there. Look at verse number 7. Jesus said, ask, and it will be given to you. What's the first word there? 
Ask, and it will be given. See, this is all over the Bible. In fact, we're going to turn to a couple other scriptures just to sear it in our heart and in our mind that God's will is something that doesn't just happen automatically, that prayer is an instrument that causes it. So when we become a person of prayer and we ask, it will be given. Notice Jesus is telling us, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. I like that phrase, don't you? Everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, verse number 9 says, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven, notice this phrase, give good things to those who ask him? Notice again, the Lord will give good things, not to those who need them, not to those who want them. Jesus is saying God gives good things to those who what? Ask him. It's, Jesus is telling us, if you want to receive things from the Lord, don't just put it all up on God. Open your mouth and tell the Lord what you want. He's a good God. I don't know what you want in life, what you're looking for. Ask God for it. If you're still single and you're praying for a spouse or you're believing for a spouse, pray and ask God for a spouse. Don't just try to seek without asking God. Amen. If you want breakthrough with your work or with your job or with promotion, ask God for it. He wants to know what is it that you'd like. Now, our son is only uh, just over a year old. He's 14 months old. And so his first Christmas was this last December, and he was only about nine months old uh, at Christmas time. So, you know, he's still way too young to put in Christmas lists. But I remember as a kid growing up, I used to make Christmas lists and would tell my mom and dad, here's what I want for Christmas. And I would love to watch uh, TV shows so I can see commercials and see what are the toys that are out there. And I would make these Christmas lists. And I would say, I want this, I want that, I want this. You know, And my parents loved it because uh, I would you know, help them out rather than them buying something that I don't want. Now, when you think about it in the heart of a parent, you want to give a gift to your, to your children, something that they want. Isn't that true? Now, we give them what they need as well. They need their vegetables, right? They need a spanking sometimes. They, there's all kinds of things they need. But when it comes to gifts, you want to give them something that they want, not something that they don't want. And so that's, and that's in you because that's in the heart of our Father. He wants to give us things that we want, wants to give us things that we will enjoy. And he wants us to ask for those things. There are many times, I remember there was a time when I was growing up where my parents, they couldn't afford really anything. And we were eating hot dogs and, and turkey most of, most of for months on end because finances were tight. And I remember around Christmas time, they just weren't able to get the gifts that, you know, we had said, oh, I sure would like that because you're seeing these commercials. And my parents are like, oh, I just can't can't afford that. But let me just tell you something. If my parents could have afforded it, and some of you may relate to this as well, that you would love to be able to give your children what they want. And sometimes when you feel limited and you can't afford it and you just can't give them whatever it is because the finances are tight, it could break your heart. And you could think, oh, I sure would love. Not because you think they're greedy or you're trying to give them the love of money or all that. You're just realizing, I want to give them what they really want, what they really would like, and you feel limited. But let me tell you something about our God. He is not limited. He's not limited to a budget. He's not limited to finances. And so our God has all resources to bring his plan and his promises to come to pass for all of us. Isn't that right? It is within him. And so he's saying, ask. I want to know that you want it, which this, by the way, is the reason why there is still poverty all around the world, which, by the way, there's poverty because there's the curse. The Bible talks about poverty being in the curse. There's always going to be the poor. There's always going to be people who are hungry. And you see nations and people where there's those that are hungry, those that are going without. And you wonder, why is God not just bringing and causing things? Well, what you'll find is God doesn't just give good things to those who need, but those who ask. we got to be people who ask and say, Lord, I want your breakthrough in my life. Amen? And so let's be a people who 
ask. Ask and it will be given to you. He gives good things to those who ask. But you know what I like? When Jesus says, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who asks receives. How many of you know that includes you? Isn't that right? No one is left out on being able to make prayer requests to the Lord. Everyone who asks receives. In fact, listen to the way that Jesus says it in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, and I'm going to highlight it this way. He personalizes this faith of prayer. He says, therefore, I say to you personally, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Jesus is telling us that we need to have the faith, and he's wanting to convince us that you and I personally can get our prayers answered. Sometimes we don't pray because we think God isn't hearing our prayers, and so we have someone else pray for us. We might ask someone else to, uh, you know, hey, I've got this request. Can you pray for me? Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with having other people pray for you. The Bible talks about a prayer of agreement. And the Bible also talks about intercession. We're not going to get into those details, but it is okay to have other people pray for you. Amen. I love having people pray for me. And I'll, I'll put requests out there. But if the reason that we're having other people pray for us is because we somehow believe that God won't hear our prayers, then we need to hear the Lord and build our faith that he wants to hear your prayers and he will hear your prayers. You are not forgotten by the Lord. You are not someone that, that the Lord is saying you have to have a pastor pray for you. Uh-uh. The Lord wants you to be convinced. You can pray. Look at it again. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So let's be a people of prayer and realize we can approach God individually and pray. Amen. So God is a relational God individually to each and every one of us. So let's pray and ask the Lord. Listen, James 4.2 says this, you do not have because you do not ask. Now, that's pretty straight up, isn't it? It's really telling us we don't have. Now, the next verse in this passage, and I'll get back to what I was about to say, the next verse tells us that sometimes we ask outside of God's will. And so those, when you pray for something outside of God's will, it's not going to happen. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is not saying we're not getting because it's not God's will. This verse is saying it might be God's will, but you don't have it because you just haven't asked. Isn't that a shame to think, I wonder how many things is in God's will, and he wants me to get it, and I want to get it, but I haven't gotten it simply because I haven't asked. You almost think it's so ridiculous to think if it is that simple and we really believe it, then why don't we pray more often? See, I want to pray prayers and ask. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm asking for this. I'm asking for that. I'm asking for this breakthrough, that breakthrough. Because I don't want it to be said when I get to heaven and I look at all the things the Lord has provided for me and he said, do you know what stopped that? It's simply you didn't ask. Boy, I want to be someone who asks. So guess what? It can't hurt to just ask God. Isn't that right? So let's ask God. And whether we're asking in his will or out of his will, we'll let him work that stuff out. But let's ask the Lord. Amen. And by the way, when I'm saying things that are not in his will, don't misunderstand. The promises in his word, the Bible says, are yes and amen. So we're not talking about God promising something in his word and him just saying, no, it's not my will for you. No, we need to have faith in the promises of God. Um, for example, salvation is God's will for everyone. Forgiveness is God's will for everyone. Healing, ultimately, is God's will for everyone. There might be reasons we're not getting healed because of, you know, the fallen nature and demonic activity, sin, for example. There's multiple reasons, but it is ultimately God's will. He wants us to line those things up. So what I'm saying is we need to be a people who simply ask God. Here's point number three is, and the last point, be a person of prayer. Be a person of prayer. So prayer is a key spiritual instrument that causes God's will to come to pass, and God answers prayer. So let's be a person of prayer. Praise God. Jesus was a man of prayer. 
Jesus was a man of prayer. In Luke 11, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass, as Jesus, that's he, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, that he ceased, I'm sorry, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Remember, I touched on that a little earlier. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, we're on the point, be a person of prayer. Let's find out how Jesus teaches us to pray. And this is where you're going to be able to put real practical steps into our prayer life. He says, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So Jesus said to them, here's the first thing he says, when you pray, say. When you pray, say. Can you say that out loud with me? When you pray, say. Say that again. When you pray, say. Notice he says, when you pray, say. Listen, the first thing we need to understand is prayer is verbal. Prayer is verbal. You're going to find all throughout the Bible that people prayed saying prayer is verbal. Now, I know that God knows our thoughts, okay? We know that. But Prayer is not just simply thoughts. Prayer is something out of the mouth. It's communication with God, not just thoughts. I, my wife can know what I'm thinking, by the way. She knows how to read my mind. It is, it is the weirdest thing. I could be paying attention to her, looking her right in the eye, and I'm literally paying attention to her. And then a thought will cross my mind, and my mind just goes, and I mean within a split second, she'll go, you're not listening anymore. I don't know how she knows my thought. She also knows if something's on my mind. You're thinking about work, aren't you? Which I do that often. And I was like, yeah, I am thinking about work. Or you're thinking about this, aren't you? You're thinking about that. I'm like, how does she know my thoughts? She knows my thoughts toward her. But guess what? Though she knows my thoughts, she loves it when I communicate words to her. Isn't that right? She knows I love her. She knows my thoughts toward her are good. But she loves the communication of it. God's the same way. See, words are chosen. Thoughts aren't always chosen. Did you know that? And how many of you know that's a good thing because bad thoughts can cross your mind, and that doesn't mean you chose that bad thought. See, thoughts aren't necessarily chosen. They don't require any type of thought. Really, it's funny. Thoughts don't require thought because they just happen, but words are chosen. Words are communication. Words are something that now you're formulating what is on your heart and mind. And so that's where Jesus is telling us when you pray, say. So prayer is verbal. It doesn't need to be loud. But prayers is words, chosen words. You can mutter under your mouth. You can uh, uh, whisper. But prayer is verbal. It's really formulating words. Now, look over at Matthew chapter number 6, and this is where we're going to spend the last few moments looking at this particular passage on Matthew's account of the Lord's Prayer. Because Matthew tells us, uh, gives us more instructions that Jesus gave us. So Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer But if you back up in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 5, listen to what Jesus is saying. And he gives us steps. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, in verse number 5. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, he's telling us how to pray, go into your room, And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows uh, the things you have need of before you ask him. Notice, before you ask him, he knows what you're thinking, He knows already what you need, but he wants us to ask him. You guys see, and again, he's saying, he already knows, but he wants you to ask him. And he says, uh, your father already knows the things you, you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven. So there's the, there's the Lord's Prayer. But in verse number 6, it's packed with incredible truths about prayer. This whole passage is so powerful. Jesus is telling us right here, How to have the kind of prayer that gets results. How many of you want the kind of prayer that gets results? I do too. He's telling them that here. The kind of prayer that cultivates a very real and personal relationship with the Lord. And it's the kind of prayer Jesus himself talks about. But here's what he gives us in verse number six. He gives us five steps to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer. In fact, that's the title of the message, Cultivating a Lifestyle of Prayer. 
And in this passage, he gives us five steps. They're so practical. And I want to show you these five steps quickly as uh, we wrap these things up. But we need to, we need to see this passage. Here is step number one. If you're taking notes, write this down. Make time to pray. Make time to pray. Notice in verse number six, it says, but you, when you pray, when you pray. Notice Jesus does not say if you pray. Is that right? When you do. See, this is the normal Christian life to be a person of prayer. He's saying when you pray, but notice when you pray. When, that requires time, when you do it. So make time to pray. Be intentional with your uh, time. Find the time. Schedule it in. See, this kind of prayer that Jesus is talking about here is very intentional prayer. He's not telling us just to pray flippantly and casually and pray on the go. He's telling us be very intentional with times of prayer. Now, There's a distinction, let me say it this way, there's a distinction between praying on the go and going to pray. Pray on the go or go to pray. Let me tell you what I mean by the difference. The Bible does say we should pray always. Isn't that right? Pray always. Pray without ceasing. We should be people who pray when we're in our car, when we're going somewhere. It's always appropriate to pray. It's always appropriate to praise and worship the Lord, too. And so even when you wake up in the morning, if you're rushed, you know, and you're jumping in the shower, you can pray while you're in the shower. You can pray while you're in the bathroom, for that matter. You can pray wherever you're at, when you're at work, when you're on your break. Yes, pray on the go. Wherever you are, pray. Communicate with God. Keep the channels open between you and him. Yes, it's absolutely appropriate, and and the Bible talks about doing that. We should do that. But Jesus is telling us something deeper than just praying on the go. He's saying, go and pray. That means you're spending time specifically to pray. You're not praying on the way somewhere else. You're saying, no, I'm going to pray. I don't even know there's a difference there. You can pray in the car going somewhere, and you should. But Jesus is telling us there are those times where you need to go and pray. And to do that, we need to make time for that kind of prayer. Because if we don't make intentional time for that kind of personal, devoted, intimate prayer between just us and the Lord, then we'll fill our time with all the other busy things of life. See, we've got to squeeze in. Make time to pray. When you pray, find the time to pray. And let me say it this way. Find the right time. Find the time where you can have quality time, not rush time. Put it on your calendar if you need to. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm I'm scheduling an appointment with you this day. Monday morning, 7 o'clock in the morning or 6 in the morning or Friday evening, instead of going out with our friends, instead of watching our favorite TV show, we're going to set aside this hour. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be, you know, prayer and intercession and fasting for weeks on end. There's appropriateness for that too. But there are times where we can just say, Lord, this Friday evening, maybe even as a family, We're going to make time and we're going to pray as a family. We're going to pray to the Lord. We're going to not just pray on the go. We're going to go and pray. We're going to spend time in prayer. How many of you see the difference between the two? They're both appropriate. They both have their place. But Jesus is saying, this is the kind of prayer that he's teaching us to have, that intentional, personal time of prayer. So put it on your calendar if you have to. Make an appointment with God. Don't squeeze out your time with God for all these other things. And you have to be very proactive and intentional to make time to pray. Look at an example of Jesus in Mark 1.35. It says, now in the morning, in the morning, having, having risen a long while before daylight, in other words, this is a very intentional time to pray. Before the rest of the world wakes up, before all the distractions show up and life moves on, he went out to a the, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So notice he was intentional with his time. In the morning. Now, you might not be a morning person. You might not be an evening person. But let's not make excuses like, I'm just not a morning person, and so I just don't have. Well, let's find the time. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to be in the morning. It could be in the evening. It could be in the afternoon. But find the time and let it be the intentional time of prayer with the Lord. By the way, this wasn't just a one-time event for Jesus. He had a lifestyle 
where he took time to pray regularly. The Bible says in Luke 5, 16, that Jesus himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. He often, everybody say often. So this just wasn't just once a year where he spent a time of prayer, right? I pray on the go. I pray in my meals. I do all that. But just once a year or once a month. No, the Bible says often he withdrew into the wilderness. So this needs to be something that becomes a regular part of our life. So the busier that Jesus got, the more often he prayed. Did you know that? The busier he got, and sometimes the busier we get, the more often we need to pray. Here's step number two. Find the right place to pray. Find the right place to pray. So finding the right place is just as important as finding the right time. Look at verse number six. But you... When you pray, go into your room. That's the next part of that verse. So when you pray, there's the time. Go into your room, that's the place. So finding the right location is just as important as finding the right time. And we must be just as intentional to find it. Listen, and you don't have to go to a church. You don't have to go to a confessional or a chapel. Amen. Jesus said you can go into your own room. This location of prayer is so close to us. It could be your own bedroom. It could be a park. It could be the beach, praise God. That's where I like to go. It could be somewhere. But we need to find the right location. But when you're looking for the right location, find a location that is conducive to times of prayer as well. Isn't that right? You might not want to pick the movie theater while you're watching a movie, (laughs) right? You know, because there's other things there. But you want to find the right location. Uh, time, and you want to find the right place. Listen, the Bible does say we ought to pray always, and I've already covered that. Man ought to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Pray without ceasing. You know, the Bible talks about this all over the place. Take up the whole armor of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Jesus said, watch therefore and pray always. So if we're ought, if we should be people who pray always, don't you think that our homes should probably be the place where we more frequently pray? Because we're home often. We're home every day, hopefully, you know, unless you're traveling and you have a busy work schedule. But when we're home, our homes ought to be places where we can spend time in prayer. I want to encourage you, turn your home into a place of prayer. Jesus said when he went into the temple, I uh, quoted an Old Testament scripture, but he's applying it. In, the, in his day with the temple, and he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Isn't that right? Well, if Jesus' house should be called a house of prayer, and if we're Christ-like and we're in him, shouldn't our homes be called a house of prayer? So we can have our homes. You don't just have to think, well, let's go to church and pray. Go to church and pray. Every time church opens up for a time of prayer, be there. Pray. Absolutely. But your home can be a place of prayer, and it ought to be a place of prayer. Here's an example of Jesus finding the right place to pray in Luke 6:12. It says now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray. He went to the mountain to pray. Notice he didn't go to the mountain to camp and he prayed while camping. I love camping. My wife and I we go to Sequoia, we go to Zion, we go to we've gone to Mammoth, we go to trips. We love camping. But typically we're going there to camp, but when we camp, we pray. How many of you know that's true? We will do that. We will go camping and pray. But this is Jesus, again, not praying on the go. He's finding a time and a place to pray. That's the reason he's going. He's not going for another reason and throwing prayer on top, though it's good. He's going somewhere to pray. About two months ago, I wanted to spend a day with the Lord, and I, 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 I took time out of my schedule and took a day off of work and spent time in prayer. And I went somewhere specific to pray in Laguna Beach, praise God. But I went down to a specific place to pray. That's why I went. Now, when I was there, I got hungry. And so I was eating something and, and, you know, had a little, you know, tea that had blackberries and all kinds of stuff in it. You know, it was kind of a interesting drink, but it was good. But I was there, you know, taking care of things as I need to, but I wasn't there to eat. I wasn't there for the beach. I wasn't there to get a tan. I did when I was praying, but that wasn't why I went. (laughs) How many of you know what I'm saying? 
I didn't just throw prayer on top of something that I was really after. No, I was really after prayer. I went for prayer. And you know, when you know that you're going there, that time, that place for prayer, you can help eliminate the distractions. Oh, that water looks really good. Let me just jump in. Then you're out there for four hours in the water because you brought your surfboard and your Bible, (laughs) right? Get what I'm saying? You got to go somewhere to pray. Jesus went to the mountain to pray. And I'm sure he enjoyed the sights and he enjoyed nature as well, but that wasn't why he went. He went to pray, which brings me to step number three, which is eliminate distractions. Eliminate distractions. Verse number six, continuing this passage that Jesus brings up, he says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, notice the phrase, shut your door. He's telling us, eliminate the distractions. You know, it's amazing how many distractions we have in our day and age. Isn't that true? It's, out, it's, it's, it's crazy. We have entertainment. We've got music. We've got the internet. We've got Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. We've got emails, phone calls, text messages, you know, calendar alerts, task lists, not to mention everything else that just crosses your mind. We have so many distractions. And what's worse about all the distractions is we are surrounded by devices that deliver the distractions. This thing right here, this iPhone, it has all those things that I just mentioned. It's got a camera, it's got a video, it's got internet, it's got email, it's got text messages, it's got phone calls, it's got Facebook, it's got Instagram, I don't have Snapchat, it has Twitter, it's got uh, news apps on here. Man, it's got all kinds of stuff on this device. My mobile banking, alerts if a, a bill is due. These devices distract us, and sometimes we can go and have the right time, find the right place, but then we allow everything else to still distract us. Jesus says, shut your door. You know, there are, there are times where Jesus is telling us, those times of prayer, do your best to eliminate as many distractions as possible. Turn your phone off if you need to. The world will move on if you spend an hour or two in prayer. You know, and I know that there might be some reasons you cannot You know, you have a child that needs to reach you. Okay, I understand that. But the point is eliminate as much distractions as possible. Don't let yourself be distracted. Because you can be trying to spend time in prayer, and then you think, oh, let me check and see how many likes I got on Instagram. And you'll just check Instagram to find out real quick while I'm pausing in my time of prayer. But those things can distract us. Isn't that right? Or am I the only one that gets distracted by those things? That's why sometimes you might not want to just pray in your bedroom You know, because maybe you've got six kids (laughs) and they'll all bang on your door. But maybe when your kids are asleep, for example, you know, and remember Jesus, he went early in the morning before the world woke up. Sometimes you need to spend that time, maybe when your kids are down, when there's going to be limited distractions. And so eliminate the distractions. Close the door. Shut off your cell phone. Shut down your computer. Turn off the music if you need to. Sometimes worship music helps. But sometimes even that could be distracting. I mean, we need to just be whatever we need to do to be a people of prayer where we're we're praying with the Lord. By the way, I love listening to worship music when I pray. And then there's times where, boy, I want to turn that off because I don't want to just pray and worship those. But I want to communicate with the Lord my own words. And he loves that too. He loves that too. Have you ever noticed when you give a card to someone you love? could be a, uh, your mom, your dad, your kids, a spouse, even a friend. You know, you're giving a card to someone that means a lot to you. And you'll go to the grocery store or CVS or Hallmark or wherever you're buying your cards, and you want to find a card that has the right words, you know, and has the right cover. You know, my mom loves really feminine flower cards with fonts that curl 16,000 times. My mom loves that, okay? It's almost like, you know, as... Well, let me just stop. Okay, but my mom loves, so I look for those kind of cards because I know it means a lot to her, and I, find, I try to find cards that say just the right thing. But I don't just hand my mom that card and say, from Tristan. How many of you do the same thing? You'll write your own words in there. And you know what means the most to people is when they read the words that were written by the one who gave it. Yes, the words on the card mean a lot because you pick that card saying this card also communicates what I mean, but it's these words. And that's how it is with prayer. That's how it is with worship. Yes, the Lord loves when we worship him with songs and lyrics that have been written, but he loves it when aside from that, we just tell him what's really on our heart and mind. We need to do the same thing with prayer. Eliminate the distractions. 
turn off all the noise and, uh, and spend some time in prayer. This is why finding the right location is also really important. Here are some examples of Jesus eliminating distractions. In Mark 135, the Bible says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, so again, before all the distractions are there, like I find in my life, once 930, it's about 930 where it just seems like the text messages, work emails, phone calls, that just seems to be the, the time where, okay, ready or not, the world is waiting for me. <laughs> That's how it seems. So I know if I really want to try to eliminate distractions, I need to um, do that. Jesus is being very intentional. But notice it says he went out and departed to a solitary place. What's that mean? Just me and God, solitary, no distractions. And there he prayed. And there he prayed. Matthew 14, 23, here's another example. And when Jesus had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Notice the words by himself. Corporate prayer is important. Prayer of agreement is important. But Jesus is a, teaching us, go into your room, close the door, have that one-on-one personal time with the Lord. Luke 9.18 says this. This is a funny example. Uh, he says, and it happened as Jesus was alone praying. So is Jesus alone praying? Yes. But notice what it says. We have it up there, alone praying, that his disciples joined him. And guess what happened? Jesus started a conversation with his disciples. Have you ever felt like you're alone praying and then something does just kind of come and interrupt? But this is exactly a good example. Jesus was somewhere intentionally trying to avoid distractions, but got distracted, and then the time of prayer was over. So we know that people and distractions happen but we need to do our part to eliminate distractions. Here's step number four. And this may seem obvious, but it requires intentionality. Pray. Pray. <laughs> so the reason why I'm saying that is because you could find the right time. You can find the right place. You can eliminate distractions and fall asleep. You know what I find? <laughs> when I finally are in an atmosphere where I've, I've got the time, I've got the place, and nobody's bothering me right now. Oh, it's the most relaxing <laughs> environment. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And you could fall asleep, right? So it seems obvious, but when you're in those times, pray. Be intentional. That's why you're there. He went to the mountain to pray. You're doing this to pray, to pray. Also, even if you don't fall asleep, you can let your mind wander. You can be there, and now you're thinking all these other things. You're thinking about work. You're thinking about what to do tomorrow. You're thinking, and so you have the right time, the right place, no distractions. But again, your mind's wandering. You're not there to pray, or you're, you're still getting yourself distracted. So it's time to pray. Verse 6, and continuing this lesson, he says, But you, when you pray, that's make time to pray, go into your room, that's uh, find a location to pray, a place to pray, and when you have shut your door, that's eliminate distractions, here's number four, pray to your Father. So pray to your Father. What is prayer? Well, what is prayer? Prayer is simply communicating with God. Did you know that? That's as simple as prayer is. You don't need a theological degree. You don't need to speak in King James English. You don't need to quote scripture and verse. You don't need to sound like a preacher. You don't need to sound like someone who's got a degree in theology. How many of you know prayer? And God is so relational and personal. He just wants you to communicate to him. That's as simple as prayer is. You don't need to sound religious. He just wants you to be real and, relig and, um, and natural and relational with him. So you might not even know what the Bible says about certain things. But you do know what's on your heart. Simply share with God the things that are on your heart. And you know you can talk to God just as, as simply as you talk to your best friend or your spouse. Just talk to God that real. You know, I like to talk to God very real like that. Not, you know, and there's the time where there's the declarations, especially in a corporate setting of worship and prayer, where there's declaration and there's a leading out in prayer, and that has its place. But sometimes we can think that personally we just have to approach God always with just this thunderous declaration. And though you can, sometimes we just need to approach God and say, Lord, you know, I kind of had a rough, rough day today. 
And I don't know why this is going on, but can I just talk to you about it? And, Lord, there are some things that are concerning me. I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about that. I don't have all the answers. But, Lord, I, I'm coming to you for wisdom. I'm coming to you for guidance. I'm coming to you just to let you know I need you. How many of you know, just talk to him so real. He is real. He's not just this cosmic being. He is real. He's personal. He loves you. And he wants you just to simply talk to him. Jesus spent time talking to the Father. And yes, he knows your thoughts, but he loves communication. Speak to him. Talk to him. He's so real. And here's step number five. Receive from God. Receive from God. It almost seems like, is that really a step for us? And in some ways it is. Because we need to receive from God. Verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who's in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. In other words, your prayer is going to be answered. So receive from God. Listen to what Hebrews 11.6 says. uses the same word, reward. And in Hebrews 11.6, the Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This, again, addresses God's will not automatically coming to pass. Isn't that right? But when you diligently seek the Lord and you come in prayer and you ask the Lord, he will reward. Now, that word reward is interesting because we think of a reward almost like, you know, we're a dog and you're a reward for here's a little milk bone because you did your little trick. That's not what the Bible's talking about, that God's rewarding us for how good of a job that we did. That's not the Greek word used here. It, it, it implies reward because a reward literally is receiving something that is due. So it is a reward. But what's interesting is in the Greek, that word, you'll be interested in this, literally means one who pays wages. It means an exchange. I like this. To deliver what is due, things promised under oath. To deliver what is due things promised under oath. See, God's promises are exactly what they are. They're his promises. He swore in a covenant language and covenant that these are for you, but they're due. And notice it says, to deliver what is due, things promised under oath. So they're due us, right? They're promised to us, but there are things that we do that activates that, and prayer is one of them. This word literally means do upon request. Isn't that interesting? Do upon request. So what that means is the Lord's already promised it. He's already given it, but when you ask the Lord, it's like the Lord says, now you're making it do. Are you guys seeing what I'm saying? Because the Lord wants you to have a healthy marriage, and he'll do everything he can to give you a healthy marriage. And if your marriage is on the rocks or something's going on there. But it's God's will to reconcile. It's God's will to restore. It's God's will to bring it and strengthen it and bring it from glory to glory and faith to faith. But when you ask the Lord and say, Lord, I'm diligently seeking you, an exchange happens. You ask the Lord, and now he's exchanging your request with the promise that's now due upon Request. See, this is why prayer is so powerful. Isn't that right? And so we need to become a people of prayer. So here's what the Lord is saying to us today. Number one, prayer is a key spiritual instrument that causes God's will to come to pass. Prayer does. Number two, God answers prayer. And because of that, let's be a people of prayer. Amen. And here are the steps. And as we pray and as we uh, now go before the Lord, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, really, what is, what is the Lord saying to you in this message? And Jesus gave us five very practical steps. With your eyes closed and head bowed, I'm just going to walk through these five steps. I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do regarding these five steps? The first thing the Lord is saying is make time to pray. Make time to pray. So ask the Lord right now, and even maybe make a commitment. Maybe even while you're sitting here right now, the Lord may give you exactly the time and say, I want you to pray tomorrow morning. I want you to wake up a little extra early. I want you to spend maybe this Friday, turn off your TV just for one night, for one hour. It doesn't need to be long. 
Maybe one hour even seems like too long. Start at 30 minutes. Start somewhere. Just make the time. Lord, I pray even right now that as we're wrapping this up and we're spending time with you, hearing what you have to say to us, that your word says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. We didn't just come here to hear a message about prayer, just to say amen and to build our faith. And while those things are all good, I pray, Lord, that each one of us in this room this morning will walk away from here wanting to be a doer of the word. Lord, I also know that it is important for all of us to pray on the go, to pray without ceasing, to be very natural and real with you throughout our day, throughout our evening, when we lie down, when we wake up, when we're with our family, when we're with our friends. Yes, we want to be a people who pray all the time. But Lord, you're calling us to be a people who go a little deeper in our time of prayer with you, where we will make time to pray. That's why we're setting aside this time. I pray, Lord, right now that each one of us will make this commitment. And if you have a journal or you have something to write down on, and if, if you're ready to even just make a commitment tonight or this morning and just say, Lord, I'm committing this Tuesday morning at this time or this Thursday. Maybe there's something that you already know. Don't let this moment pass you by. And if you can't commit to a time right now, I understand. I don't know what your calendar's like, but just don't forget to make time to pray. Lord, I pray that we'll not only find the right time, but the right place. And Lord, I pray that our homes will be a, a place where we spend this time of prayer with you as it allows. It doesn't mean we can't also find a place at the beach or in the mountains. But Lord, I do pray that we will also turn our homes into a place where we spend time in prayer with you. And Lord, if that place isn't conducive, because maybe we're roommates and we've got all kinds of, there's distractions all around us, that we'll find the right place. Maybe the Lord's dropping in your heart, here's a place that I want you to go. Maybe it's a park. Maybe it's just down the street from your house. Maybe it is in the church. It can be the church, of course. But what is that time? What is that place? And Lord, I pray that we'll eliminate distractions. I pray, Lord, that when we go for this time of prayer, that that's what it'll be for. It'll be to pray. I know that we have devices that alert us all the time and take our mind off of sometimes the things that are right in front of us. And we get distracted with social media and text messages. But I pray, Lord, that we will each be strengthened to do our part to eliminate as many distractions as possible. Of course, we can't eliminate all of them. Even Jesus got distracted when he went. The disciples came to him. We can't stop it all. But let's be very intentional to do the best we can. Maybe even right now the Lord's telling you these are distractions. Sometimes you might think, well, I want to go and pray with a friend, and that's good too. There's a place for that. But the Lord might say, but I want you just alone. Turn off the phone. Maybe that place that you're going to will distract you. So, Lord, I pray that we eliminate distractions. And let's commit to the Lord that we will actually pray. We won't just let our mind wander, but we'll actually pray. Lord, I thank you that we here at The Rock will be a people of prayer because we know that you answer prayer. And through prayer, we can reel in the promises that you've given to us and that you want us to have. Ask and it will be given. Everyone who asks receives. Your word says that many people do not have simply because they do not ask. Well, Lord, I pray that when we're in those times of prayer that we will ask, we will pray, we will communicate with you. We will pull down those things that you have prepared for us in, in heaven and we'll pull them down into our lives, into our circumstances, into our families. I thank you, Lord, for it. And Lord, I pray that even when we do pray that we'll receive from you, that we'll wait on you. You said in your word that people who 
make time to pray, find the right place to pray, eliminate distractions, and pray that those who pray in the secret place, that you will reward them openly. Some of these are prayers that nobody else on earth will ever know about. They're that personal. There are things that we're asking you for that are so deep, so personal, that only you know. But Lord, when the answer does come, everyone sees it. Everyone sees the breakthrough. Everyone sees the blessing. Everyone sees the power of our God. But not for our credit, not for our glory, which is why we do it in the secret place. But you want to reward openly those who have this kind of lifestyle of prayer. So I pray, Lord, that we will not just be a people who pray on the go, but we will go and pray in the secret place without distractions, talking to our God and listening to you speak to us, giving us direction, giving us steps, giving us guidance, and ultimately, Lord, giving us the answers that we are asking for. And I pray, Lord, that because we will be a people committed to this kind of deep personal prayer, that everyone else around will see our prayers coming to pass because you reward us openly. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray that the things that have held your people back will no longer hold us back, that we will receive everything that you have given to us in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And if you believe that, will you say amen? Give the Lord a hand praise. Praise God. Praise God.